Ever since it was added in 315, Spectral Helix has been quite popular. And usually, when I'm making a last build of a league in Path of Exile, I want to go all out. I want to find something that's just absurdly, stupidly, obscenely broken. Something so good that I'll be amazed if it isn't nerfed when 318 rolls around. And so, I decided that my last league build for 317 was going to be a claw-based Trinity Nightblade Spectral Helix Raider using Crystallized Omniscience. And if you're seeing a lot of red flags there, well, that's exactly the point. In large part, due to the strength of both Nightblade and Spectral Helix as a skill, there's a very good chance that you would have been able to League start something like this in 317. In fact, using a White Wind, you get shockingly good damage numbers. But of course, White Wind will only take you so far. So, if you want to push into the endgame, I suggest dropping the White Wind and switching over to a multi Ellie Claw and adding Trinity. The best part about using Trinity and Nightblade is you conveniently solve a problem which Spectral Helix, Spectral Throw, and the Steel skills have suffered from for a very long time, which is that non-bow projectile attack skills really lack support gems. Most support gems either say melee or bow on them, which is a problem if you're using something that's neither. But since you can use Nightblade and since you can use Trinity, that takes care of two supports out of the five you'll be using. Inspiration takes care of a third, Awakened Weapon Elemental Damage is a fourth, and finding a fifth support isn't all that difficult. So what this leads to is a character that's very fast while mapping. It has surprisingly decent clear, both in terms of open areas and also enclosed ones like Delve due to the bounce mechanic that Spectral Helix has. And finally, what's the bossing like? Well, given that we're leveraging Farshot and leveraging Crystallized Omniscience and leveraging so many other broken mechanics, what boss? So now, I'm going to get into some of the mechanics leveraged by this build. There's two things that I won't be talking about here. The first is Crystallized Omniscience. That's because I already have a video on that. The quick TLDR is, you get pen and res from stacking attributes. It doesn't matter what attributes you stack, strength, intelligence, or dex. If you're stacking multiple attributes, the value is applied to Omniscience, but it doesn't double dip. So 25 strength and 25 dex on a mod is 25 Omniscience, not 50. When it comes to Spectral Helix, if you want more details on that, then I do have a video where I talk about the Spectral Helix mechanics and break down how it works. The quick TLDR is that you send out copies of your weapon which spiral around your character. These will damage any enemy that happens to be in their path once every 300 milliseconds, meaning you can hit the same enemy multiple times depending on the path of your spiral. If Spectral Helix hits a wall, it will bounce off reversing its direction and continuing to spin. Unfortunately, Sniper's Mark completely breaks Spectral Helix as it stops it from spinning, so you shouldn't use Spectral Helix with Sniper's Mark. Now, what about some mechanics that I haven't already talked about? To start with, Farshot. Farshot is a Deadeye Ascendancy node. Projectile attack skills deal up to 60% more damage based on distance. The interesting thing is, Farshot isn't calculated based on distance from player. It's calculated based on the distance traveled by the projectile. Spectral Helix, with its long circuitous roots, is perfect for Farshot. Once your projectile has traveled for about 100 units, it will gain the maximum damage bonus from Farshot. So, through testing and trial and error, I found you could stand pretty close to a boss. The ideal range seems to be about 1 to 2 rotations away from the boss. This way, as you throw the Helix, it'll have plenty of time to gather momentum and gather damage. But honestly, Spectral Helix does so much damage that as long as you're roughly within the ballpark and as long as you're not standing directly on top of things you're fighting, you should be pretty fine regardless of where you are. And this brings up another important point. Why are we Raider instead of Deadeye? Wouldn't Deadeye be more damage? Well, you don't really need more damage. Spectral Helix already does all the damage. So instead, the important thing is having a good defensive base. Raider offers Quartz Infusion, which is a 40% chance to suppress spell damage, meaning that getting Suppression Cap is far easier. Similarly, you get Avatar of a Veil, which is 50% chance to avoid elemental ailments while phasing. Keep in mind, Quartz Infusion says that you have phasing at all times. So you can easily cap Eliavoid, making you immune to all elemental and alt elemental ailments. Finally, nearby enemies have Fire, Cold, and Lightning Exposure while you have phasing, applying minus 20% to those resistances. So, additional res shred for damage, on top of a pen from Trinity, and on top of a pen that we get from Crystallized Omniscience. This is great because it's both damage and defenses. And that's about the end of Raider's defenses, although it should be noted that Avatar of Slaughter with a 10% increased evasion rating is pretty relevant. 
Avatar of the Slaughter is in general great for this build, as frenzy stacking is quite easy to do. You'll get additional attack damage, which is surprisingly valuable. This build has a lot of flat increases and a lot of pen, but not all that much increased damage. You get attack speed, meaning more helixes per second, move speed to zoom zoom, and evasion rating, which is quite handy while mapping. And of course, in 317, no tri Ellie build would be complete without some sort of alt ailments. Leadership's price would be great, as that would give max res. Unfortunately, the problem with that is, it's an amulet, and I'm kind of already wearing crystallized omniscience. So instead, I opted for Secrets of Suffering. This means I can't ignite, chill, freeze, or shock, but I'll be able to scorch, brittle, and sap. And Helix hits hard enough that you'll be hitting full effectiveness on each of these. So enemies will have their resistances lowered by another 30%, you'll have plus 15% to critical strike chance, and enemies will deal 20% less damage. Basically, you're getting fortified without having to deal with all the annoying fortify mechanics. Defensively speaking, this character isn't a super tank, but it doesn't feel bad either. We've got capped spell suppression, 100% chance to avoid elemental ailments, and a good mix of armor and evasion rating. This combines the fact that when using a claw, you get a ton of life gain on hit, which of course scales with your attack speed, means that overall the build feels really good. There's certain things like Seer Storms that will hurt if I stand in them. But as long as I'm not doing anything dumb, I don't really come that close to death all too often. And offensively, how's the damage? Well, I probably don't have to say, because at this point you've seen me melt absolutely everything. So next up, I'm going to talk about gearing, itemization, and how I crafted some of the gear. But before I do, a quick reminder that if you're enjoying this build showcase, as that tells the YouTube algorithm to show this video to more people. For more Path of Exile content, sub to the channel and ring the bell to be notified whenever I upload. Also, if you prefer reading and want to go through this at your own pace, there will be a written summary of this video over on my Patreon of a $5 level. It's the same information here, but you can read it at your own pace instead of listening or watching a video. So now, let's talk items and itemization. To start with, the claw. As I mentioned before, if you want a really, really, really basic build, you could go with something as simple as the White Wind. Spectral Helix does enough damage that your weapon doesn't matter too much when you're just getting started. But if you want to really go into endgame, I suggest buying a Fractured Imperial or Gemini Claw. Gemini will solve mana, whereas Imperial is a little bit more damage. You want a Fractured Tier 1 Cold, Fire, or Lightning damage, then you roll it with Essences. It doesn't really matter which Essence, you just want to put Essence Tier Fire, Cold, or Lightning on. Whichever one, of course, doesn't overlap with your Fractured mod. From there, you just roll Essences until you hit Tier 1 or Tier 2 flat, whatever you're happy with. Then Prefixes cannot be changed, plus Reforge Speed to get the suffix of Attack Speed. From there, craft Critical Strike Chance, or Critical Strike Chance and Strength Intelligence, and then Augment Crit to finish off the suffixes. The only remaining Crit mod is Crit Multi, so it'll always be slammed on. For the Shield, you want either Spell Suppression or Chance to avoid Elemental Ailments. You can fix one of these via your chest, but not both. Of course, if you have both on your shield, then that's even better. I happened to pick this shield up for two exalts, as I was searching for something with avoid Ellie or spell suppression, some sort of attribute, strength, int, or dex, and max life. It's a very good piece, and getting about 2,000 armor feels really awesome, so I haven't really changed it since. For the helmet, you'll want to use a blizzard crown. Remember, enemies do effectively gain 10% cold res if you're using a blizzard crown, but the flat damage is absolutely worth it. If you're going for a basic helmet, any Blizzard Crown with Spectral Helix projectiles spiral through plus one rotations will be totally fine. If you want to start getting fancy, then you can start rolling with essences for attributes, or you can do what I did. I combined Elevated Shaping, nearby enemies take 9% increased elemental damage, and Elevated Hunt for 12% increased intelligence. I Awaken or Orb them together, and then got lucky and fixed the prefixes with a Veiled Chaos. I say I got lucky because I got Cold Res, Ultimately, it doesn't really change that much for me because I get so much res from my crystallized omniscience. The reason the Elevated Shaper mod is so powerful is, with all your pen, pen doesn't do that much for you, but 9% increased elemental damage taken is a further multiplier, so you can kind of think of it as you deal 9% more damage. If you're intimidating enemies like I am with my gloves, it's actually a little less, but let's just go with it because that math gets pretty messy. And a similar process can be used to create the boots. Now, I happen to buy these for 35 exalts. This is because they're just a little too perfect to pass up. But if you're making them for yourself, what you'd do is you'd roll Tailwind boots with one other modifier, or you can use a Suffixes Cannot Be Changed Harvest Reforge to force a modifier as a prefix, then use an Orb of Dominance and hope it elevates the Tailwind. If it doesn't, restart and try again. If it does, cool, your boots are good. Do the same thing to get Onslaught and elevate that then Awaken or Orb them together. 
Finally, you do suffixes cannot be changed veiled chaos for around 30% move speed. In this case, my boots have 35% move speed, they have intelligence, which is omniscience, and fizz is extra cold, which, while not necessarily that helpful, certainly doesn't hurt anything either. For my gloves, I wanted to get a little bit greedy, so I bought a bunch of fractured life gloves and started slamming them with intelligence essences. The essence you want to hit it with depends on the base of the gloves. Ideally, you'd want item level 85, but finding fractured life in item level 85 is impossible, so I didn't bother. The big advantage of using fractured gloves is you can easily keep rerolling the prefixes until you get plus two to level up socketed AoE gems for your auras. But this isn't all too necessary, so if you want something much cheaper, then just roll your gloves with any of the attribute essences until you hit double attributes and one other useful mod. Some useful mods include chaos res, attack speed, and accuracy rating with flat life regen not being too bad either. Then you'd fix the prefixes using Veiled Chaos and craft on life to finish the item. For implicits, you have a lot of different options. I ended up going with Intimidate in combination with Global Accuracy because I was lacking on accuracy. And for my rings, I used a very similar crafting method. My Chaos Res was lacking, so I bought two Fractured Bases with 40% increased elemental damage with attack skills. This build is lacking on increased damage, so I wanted as much as possible. And then I just rolled them with all of my essences and fossils. The exact most efficient method kind of varies here, because it depends on the price of essences and the price of fossils and resonators. As this went back and forth for a bit, I ended up rolling one ring with essences and the other with fossils. I was looking for as many attributes as possible on the suffixes, or of course chaos res is a suffix. Then for the prefixes, my plan was quite simple. Good old suffixes can't be changed plus veiled chaos, aiming for either life or flat damage, and then I'd craft the other. In this case, I hit life both times, and found that the 5.3 mana regenerated per second was surprisingly helpful, so I kept it. I crafted minus 7 to mana cost on 1, as I wanted my mana cost as low as possible on Spectral Helix without it going to 0, so that I could still use Inspiration and gain Inspiration charges. And on the other, I crafted flat damage, since damage is good and it scaled incredibly well. For my belt, I used, to hopefully no one's surprise, Mage Blood. This item is incredibly good for any Omniscience build, as it gives you about 100 Omniscience. It's also incredibly good because it lets you run flasks that fix all of your problems. In my case, I used an Amethyst Flask to fix my Chaos Res and gain some nice attack speed, a Jade Flask, and a Granite Flask to fix both my Evasion and my Armor Rating, and then a Quicksilver to run fast. For my final flask, I used a Bottled Faith, but it doesn't really matter what you use here. Any old damage flask is fine, just remember if you're using a Mage Blood, it has to be a unique flask, or you have to use a non-magic flask. For my chess piece, I wanted a Guadalizzi base, which means I had to purchase something with good prefixes. From there, I crafted increased life and increased mana, and then used a lot of Eldritch currencies to get spell suppression, life regen, and lightning res. My goal was to get a solid amount of chance to suppress spell damage so that I'd be able to cap my suppression. I needed at least 30%, so 34 was perfect. And then I wanted life regen and or attributes. The lightning res doesn't really help me here, but at this point it was far too expensive to try to reroll yet again for what is ultimately a pretty minimal gain. And from there, I just fixed the implicits with Eldritch Currencies, Ickers and Embers focusing on aura effect, since aura effect is the most effective value for your investment on a build like this. And finally, what about the jewels? Well, to start with, I have Forbidden Flesh and Forbidden Flame allocating Farshot. That's because this is by far the best damage ascendancy. In theory, you could also use Focal Point to increase the effect of your marks and have marks bounce around, but it was a little bit less damage, and while it was quite nice to use Poacher's Mark for a bit defensively, eventually my build scaled to the point where it didn't really matter and I just swapped over to Assassin's Mark, because why not just kill the boss in 4 seconds instead of 5? From there, I put a Lethal Pride over in the socket right near the Shadow Start, the goal here is overlap as many notables as possible, and look for strength, increased strength, etc. You can also use a Brutal Restraint, as it doesn't really matter if you're stacking strength or dex. I just happened to get a good Lethal Pride, and Lethal Pride has slightly better modifiers such as double damage. Near the Ranger start, I placed an Intuitive Leap. The Intuitive Leap lets me pick up Aspect of a Lynx, Heartseeker, Acuity, and Fervor. This just fixes a lot of problems very efficiently plus Aspect of a Lynx and Heartseeker are pretty good damage. I'm also using a Replica Conqueror's Efficiency, since otherwise mana costs were a bit problematic. Although the alternative here in terms of min-max would be to drop the Replica Conquerors, craft minus 7 on my ring, and replace this with either an Abyss Jewel that has flat damage, 
or some sort of jewel with crit chance, crit multi, increased damage, or attack speed. Which, speaking of, I have one of those. In my case, I went with attack speed, global accuracy, crit multi, and life. This jewel ended up being fairly inexpensive, all things considered, costing only about an exalt, which was quite surprising. I suspect it's because not too many people need accuracy for their builds, but as you lose all the accuracy you'd normally have from decks by using crystallized omniscience, accuracy becomes surprisingly relevant. And then, finally, my cluster jewels. And they're nothing too special. I just made sure that I had mana leech, I had attack leech, and then I had whatever the highest damage in POB was, which ended up being martial prowess, because that way I could fix my accuracy rating. Surprise, surprise. Oh, and just one note, you definitely don't need a watcher's eye like I have. The increased attack damage attack speed is very expensive, and honestly, not that impactful, because you're going to kill everything anyway. Again, it's just about killing things in 4 seconds instead of 5 or 6. In fact, the most useful Watcher's Eye that you could have would probably be something else, such as reduced extra damage taken from critical strikes while affected by determination, or gain a flask charge on crit while affected by precision. These sorts of utility things don't show up in your DPS sheet, but are ultimately very useful. And usually a lot more expensive, because they don't show up in your DPS sheet. So, now that I've talked about my gear and what I did to get it, is the build good? And should you play it? This build really surprised me. I went into it expecting Spectral Helix to feel very clunky, since that's what a lot of people had told me. Now, if I tried it at super low gearing, maybe it would have been. Maybe White Wind Spectral Helix is clunky. But instead, I went into it with a moderate budget, and I feel like as long as you have enough damage that your Helix one-shots trash as it spirals out, it'll actually feel pretty good. You don't even really need Explody effects, since each Helix has quite amazing levels of coverage. Being a raider, you get all that natural speediness. Using alt ailments, it's really easy to scale your damage. Especially since you can stack on Claws, Trinity, Nightblade, and of course, alt ailments. All the broken things which I wouldn't be surprised if they get nerfed in 318. That leads me to my one big concern about this build. Will you be able to play it in 318, or will it be nerfed to a shadow of its former self? And this is something that I can't answer. What I will say is, even if a damage is cut in half, you'll easily be able to outgear any problems that you have. This build is an absolute monster. I basically walk through maps, everything around me dies almost instantly, and when I get to a boss, it just melts. It's been a really long time since I had a build that almost one-shot bosses, and I was surprised that I was able to get this level of damage while still maintaining reasonable defenses. If you're looking for a league starter that feels super fast, and you saw Spectral Helix Champion, it looked interesting but you weren't quite sold, then, assuming no major changes to the skill, I do think Spectral Helix Raider is going to be a great league start in 318. It should have all the damage scaling you need to take you from the Twilight Strand to Cirrus, Maven, the Feared, and beyond. Being immune to ailments feels awesome, especially as more and more ailments are added to the game, making the general mapping experience far deadlier if you don't have immunity. If you're going to play Spectral Helix, I do strongly suggest picking up Longshot, as remember, the distance traveled is counted as the start of a projectile, and the time it spends flying, not the actual distance from your character, plus the projectile speed really did help when I was clearing. Defensively, I ended up going for an armor evasion hybrid, as that felt a lot better to me than taking iron reflexes and going pure armor. Despite the build feeling really fast and having the damage of a glass cannon, it could take some hits, which is really refreshing and something I greatly enjoy. The bossing, well, the bossing is certainly one of a build's strengths. So, if you're looking for an end of league project like I was, and you want a boss killer that can also map super fast, then I strongly suggest checking out Spectral Helix Trinity Nightblade Raider. Though that said, if you play it on a shoestring budget, you will be squishier, you will have a lot less damage because you won't have access to Farshot, and you might run into some problems here and there with a clear as you're scaling your gear. It's certainly not perfect, but given how many people I've seen playing Spectral Helix as their league starter, either in 316, 317, or the Gauntlet, there's plenty of evidence to prove that it's definitely viable, albeit sometimes a little bit awkward. But what are your thoughts when it comes to Spectral Helix? Is it a skill that you're excited for? Does it look a little bit too clunky? Or have you tried it in the past and do you not like it? And if Spectral Helix really isn't for you, are there any other builds that you plan to play where you might incorporate some of these mechanics? After all, it's not like Spectral Helix is the only skill that works on an Ellie stacking raider. There's plenty of other attacks that are compatible with both Claws and Ellie damage. So be sure to let me know your thoughts down in the comments below. Thank you for watching. If you have any questions, be sure to put them down in the comments below, or join the Discord where you can ask questions, get build help, and hang out with the community.
A special thanks to my patrons and YouTube channel members. They're awesome, and they get to show it by having their name on screen in the credits of all my videos. So if you want to see your name here, be sure to check the link in the description. For more general gaming content, check out my second channel, 10 Gaming Thoughts, and if you want a water bottle or a cool shirt, I have a link to my official merch shop in the description. I hope you learned something today, and I hope to see you again sometime soon.